that again. There we go. Welcome to James Ball. Uh, James, you've been busy putting together a podcast on a very South African story. How did you guys get involved in this? It's um, We've got a tobacco sort of reporting team who've been looking around uh, all sorts of issues across the companies, things like Jewel and the sort of US scandal around there um, and other things. And anytime we were sort of talking to people in this area, they kept saying, have you heard about this South Africa story? Have you heard about BAT? Um, and sort of various garbled tellings of it. You know, no one was quite saying the same thing when they were telling us about it. And it just became sort of too intriguing not to dig into. Um, and so we sort of started looking into it about a year ago, thinking we could probably do something quite self-contained. You know, there was quite public uh, sort of whistleblowers and figures on it. And then it was just one of those where you start pulling on a thread and before you know it, we've got miles and miles of yarn. And being investigative journalists and indeed being a, a, an organization that's based in the UK, there had to be a British angle to it. And you did mention BAT or British American Tobacco, uh, one of the major companies listed on the um, London Stock Exchange. Is that what really piqued your interest? In other words, that it wasn't just a purely local South African story, but uh, much bigger? Exactly that. I think, you know, the, the South Africa side of this story is, you know, sensational. There's, you know, double agents, you name it. And there's also this sort of network of informants and payments being made. But it doesn't stop just in South Africa. It clearly moves into neighbouring countries and other countries uh, across the continent, actually. But what was also interesting to us was this wasn't the case of just one man or woman on the ground or even half a dozen of them. What intrigued us was, is there a paper trail that takes this back to the global headquarters in London? And, you know, as as we're uncovering in the podcast, there actually, there, there seems to be, you know, people actually who were quite senior in BAT knew about some of the tactics being deployed by their agents on the ground. They were authorizing the payments. They were often finding ways to send the money that were quite uh, questionable. And so it definitely, you know, a lot of the story takes place in South Africa and it's, it's certainly more a South African story than anything else, but it really does have international implications. What has BAT's response been? So BAT, it should be said, deny any wrongdoing. They point to the fact that in the UK, the Serious Fraud Office has looked into this and decided not to continue its investigation. Um, although we would note the S that doesn't mean the SFO thinks there's nothing there. It suggests they don't think there's enough evidence to pursue something. They also say that these kind of intelligence efforts, you know, recruiting informants in the tobacco industry, which could be anything from quite senior executives in their rivals to someone who works on the factory floor in packing. Um, they say that's about preventing smuggling and that's part of them being responsible citizens. Um, the question that's asked is how much of this is really about stopping smuggling, which I think most people would agree is a perfectly legitimate end and how much of it is about sort of stifling their competition or monitoring their competition. So it is a podcast. It's the first time that the Bureau has gone into this side of uh, broadcasting. What made you uh, take that route? In other words, rather than just writing a, a series in text uh, to actually put together a podcast series, because it's, it's brilliantly done, highly professional, and certainly it's a riveting listen for, well, there are going to be eight episodes in, in total. We've had three so far. Another one's going to be um, available this evening. What appealed to you about the medium? I think it was that there were so many characters in this story and so many sort of twists and knots that actually, you know, often when you're turning something into a news story, you smooth those out, you tidy them away and tell people the most important facts. And, you know, we teamed up with the BBC and put out a panorama episode. We've put out the written news material we usually would. 
but we think this is a gripping story. We want to be able to tell the fuller version of it. Um, you know, a panorama sounds like loads, but it's 27 minutes. Uh, we're putting that out every episode on this. And, you know, as, as we come to episode four, we sort of got a nice, clear goodies and baddies narrative from the first three episodes. Um, you know, you have uh, Belinda Walter, this woman who supposedly was representing the small companies, and then she seemed to secretly work for BAT as well. And she's sort of turned informant and is telling journalists everything that happened. And actually, episode four blows up a lot of this. She sort of seems to suddenly turn on everyone. She starts saying uh, there were sort of secret units within the fraud team. She accuses the journalist she's talking to of all sorts of false allegations. And so because you've got these twists and this difficult narrative and these big characters, we wanted to try and tell people a fuller story and tell people a narrative. Um, so it's very new for us, but we're hoping it makes for quite a compelling experience and it also tells the full story in a better way. I'm a huge fan of the Ted Lasso series on Apple uh, TV, and I think so is most or, or many people around the world. But you've fo also followed that that format where you're not allowing all the epi episodes to come out and to be binge, uh, binge listened. Uh, like with Ted Lasso, we've got to wait for next week. In your case, we have to wait <laughs> for the Mondays. What was the thinking behind that? Um, I think partly we didn't want to have written the end before the start of it sort of went out. Things are still happening in this. We're still trying to talk to more people. We're still sort of doing this. So we're not sitting with all eight episodes in a, you know, in a safe somewhere. Um, episode eight still isn't finished. Um, and so it's nice being able to sort of do that week by week. We also sort of wanted people to get a bit compelled into the story. Obviously, people can jump in and read the background. There are books on this. There's all sorts. But we're hoping that, especially now that it's halfway through, we've got four quite bingeable episodes now. And then hopefully we can hook people to come back week by week. There's also it's a huge amount of work to do something like this. And so a week by week schedule keeps us a little bit more sane than if we try to drop it all at once. How big is the Bureau? So overall, including our regular freelancers, there's about 40 of us. Um, and we're split across uh, Global, which is our international teams, which I look after. And then we've got a local journalism unit that tries to support quality sort of local papers and local independent journalism in the UK. So, you know, we we feel a lot bigger than we used to be. 40 feels huge to us, um, but we're not we're not a sort of massive organization by any stretch of the imagination. But as far as investigative journalism goes, it is a very significant and sizable team. Hence your uh, collaboration with Panorama, which uh, maybe many South Africans aren't quite aware of what of, of the pedigree there. Maybe you can help us. It's uh, yeah. Pan Panorama is pretty much our flagship current affairs show. Um, it goes out in prime time on BBC one, which is, an audience that even in the online era, you just can't generally compete with. You get several million viewers to a story, um, which yes, if, you know, on a website, you're glad if you get 100, 200,000 people looking at something. So it, it was a real coup for us. And, you know, the BBC people were great to work with um, and actually quite collaborative, which maybe 10 years ago, places sort of didn't tend to be. The kind of good thing about sort of as we've changed and all the challenges investigative journalism has had is more and more we know we need to work together to get these stories out to tell them right and so we have seen that attitude really change and indeed uh it is available on a new platform as well in the podcasting field how did you get together with audi as the uh, as the carrier of this it's um we were we were really fortunate with Audi, really. Um we had a journalist that knew one of our senior editors who'd started working with them, who I think had probably initially quite casually mentioned, oh, if if there's ever anything. Um and so they, you know, they're a very new platform, Audi. They were looking for some content. Um, you know, they they've let us, you know, we've had 
full journalistic freedom. They've they've helped fund it. They supported it in other ways, but it's still on every platform. You know, you can listen to the podcast, which is called Smokescreen, you know, on Spotify, on Apple, on you name it. Um, but it just meant it was sort of the right place at the right time. Uh, we were looking to do something new and experiment in getting into it. They were a startup and looking for places for content. And uh, yeah, they've been a great partner to work with. So Smoke Screen is available, as you said, on, on Spotify, on iTunes, on Audi. Uh, we're going to be talking for the next four weeks with you on specific episodes, but maybe you can give us a quick wrap of what we can expect to hear in episodes one to three, uh, and then you can additionally binge watch in, I think it's opposite eight South African time when episode four will be available. So, so episodes one to three start to take you into this world and how one woman really started to unravel it. And so we meet um, JVL, Johan, uh, Johan, who everyone calls by his initials, who used to sort of be working in tobacco regulation. We meet Belinda, who was supposedly representing the smaller players, but had a series of other agendas of her own. And we start learning about what BAT was doing to keep keep an eye everywhere it could in South Africa's tobacco trade. Um, and so we start to almost get our gang together. We get Malcolm Reese, who's an investigative journalist, who she speaks to right back in 2014. Um, but then essentially, you know, episode four, the one that's coming, we start to have some plot twists. We start to see that team unravel a bit and turn on each other. Uh, we start to sort of actually hear a little bit about some, uh, you know, affairs of the heart, uh, which which really played into what happened next. And so we start to sort of see this real complexity and these tensions between different people. Um, and so, you know, this is quite a nice turn episode. It really sets up where we're starting to go with the rest of the series, which I had better not spoil it too much. So just uh, Google smoke screen and away you go. Exactly that, yes.